Oh, that looks nasty out, doesn't it? It's cold, man. It's in the teens. We don't want to go pheasant hunting, do you? No, you do? Oh, well, you're crazy. All right, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'm going to do a little bit of work here in the studio with some filming. And then if I get done in time, we'll go out and chase a pheasant and freeze. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right, it's the deal. High five. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, while Covey is downstairs getting dressed for her pheasant hunt, I want to talk to you guys about a little cartridge comparison. One of the most reviled and loved cartridges of the last 20 or 30 years, the 6.5 Creedmoor, of course. But I want to compare it to the 270 Winchester. Now, some time ago, I wrote a blog on these two cartridges and it got a lot of attention. A lot of people were surprised to find out how these two matched up. And we're going to do that in this video. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about where that 6.5 Creedmoor came from. Now, it's actually been around for a long, long time. If you consider its precursor, which is this it right here. No, that's the 260. Oh, it's right here. Look at that. This little bit longer cartridge you're looking at right beside the Creedmoor was the first 6.5. It came out in 1890. It was invented by the Norwegian Swedes, one of those up there in Scandinavian countries. They came up with a real winner in 1890. Yes, 6.5 in 1890. And this thing has been used to hunt moose and caribou and even brown bears. I mean, that is a popular cartridge in Northern Europe and has been for that long. That started the 6.5 craze, but it never really got to the United States. You know, a few people would shoot that 6.5 and then there was a 6.5 man liquor shown hour and a beautiful slick little action. I think Hemingway used that in Africa and even Caramojo Bell shot a few elephants with that, a little 160 grain bullet and he brain shot them. So the 6.5 has been making its mark for quite a while, but in the States, I don't think anything showed up with a 26 caliber bullet on it until Winchester with the 20, with a 264 Winchester Magnum. I don't think Weatherby ever had one, 270, 300, seven, don't think so. So that was 1958 or 59. So that's a long time before we even got a 26. You know, and after that, it never really took off. Um, it was buried by the seven rem mag and then Remington actually came out with a 6.5 in the 60s. It was called a 6.5 rem mag, and that was on a belted case like that 264 Winchester. But because of the problems that Winchester had with uh, throat burning in the barrels, Remington necked that or shortened that cartridge way down. So it was actually a short action 6.5, but that didn't go anywhere either. 6.5s just weren't that popular in this country until the late, but he's probably the 90s, the 1990s, these long range target shooters playing with steel targets and all that stuff. They wanted something that could reach out there without beating them up. Instead of a 300 win mag, they looked for something like the 260 Remington. So this was a 308 Winchester down to 26 caliber. And that became pretty darn popular for that long range shooting stuff, both for accuracy and for knocking over targets at long range. Now, why would you bother taking that 308, which is pretty famous as a long range sniper cartridge and neck it down to 26? Well, because that 26 caliber bullet is skinnier and it gives you a higher ballistics coefficient. A long skinny bullet is going to resist air drag. That means it's going to resist blowing in the wind. It's not gonna, well, it's going to get downrange fast enough that the wind can't affect it as much as a heavier bullet, a lower or a lower BC bullet. So you put a high BC bullet on it and you also reduce the recoil. And that's important in target shooting competitions where you have to shoot a lot because that recoil builds up after a while, you start subconsciously flinching and blowing your shots. So that was another part of the equation. Well, the 260 was doing pretty darn well because of that efficient bullet. Then uh, Norma came out with the 6.5 by 284 Norma, which was really a legitimization of a Wildcat cartridge that had also been 
working up some pretty good scores on that long range shooting stuff. And that was the 284 Winchester brass case neck down to 6.5. So what they all have in common, of course, is that 0.264 diameter bullet that they're shooting. It's a 26 caliber. And nowadays there's a lot more 26s. There's a 26 Nosler 6.5 RPM from Weatherby, 6.5 by 300 from Weatherby, a real heavy powder burner and the 264 Winchester still around. What a lot of people say about the 6.5 is they either love it or they hate it because it gets hyped so much. There's so many people that are just going on and on about that 6.5 Creedmoor, but they don't necessarily know what all the advantages or disadvantages of the cartridge are. And so uh, people will say, why waste your time? You've got the 6.5 by 55 suite. It'll do anything it does. The 260 Remington will do anything it does. Why do you want to mess around with it? Well, the reason is probably because it is a fine-tuned target cartridge. What Hornaday's engineers did when they designed this was they looked at all of the pros of a good cartridge for target shooting and high volume target shooting. What exactly did everybody want when they invented that 260 Remington or the 6x284? Well, you want the lighter recoil we talked about. You want a lower quantity of powder so you don't burn out your barrels because these guys will shoot hundreds and hundreds of rounds. They'll burn out three or four barrels in a season, if you can believe that. So there's a lot of high volume shooting going along. So let's hold that recoil down. Let's keep those long, high ballistics coefficient bullets moving down range. And then let's design the case for lots of reloads. Anyone who hand loads knows that the cases eventually wear out. And one of the problems you have with those cases is the neck stretches and you can build up what's called a donut inside right here at the junction of the uh, neck and the shoulder. You get a buildup of material inside. When you seat your bullets, they are tighter. They have extra friction and that raises pressures inside your barrel. So what uh, Hornaday wanted to do was design the cartridge so that the long bullets did not protrude into the powder space. They would just come down to the end of that junction right there on the neck. Now they've got an extremely long boat tail and a long tapered point on these bullets. Here's the uh, Hornaday one, the 143 ELDX, one of the more famous ones. And then they had to change the barrel to work well with this. You need to increase the throat length so that your bullet does not hit the rifling as you chamber that round. And then you have to increase the twist rate. And that is one of the biggest points uh, that made this 6.5 Creedmoor so effective and popular. They just started from the get-go with a high twist barrel. One turn in every eight inches. That is a quick twist and that's what's needed to stabilize those efficient long-range bullets. So you can go out and buy a, any other 6.5 and you'll probably get a 1 in 9 or 1 in 10 twist barrel. They do pretty well, but for really tight groups and efficiency and accuracy with those long, long, long bullets, you want a one and eight twist. There's where the Creedmoor really shines. So the, the target aspects of that cartridge are pretty evident, but what about hunting? A lot of old timers will say that's a joke for hunting because it's too slow at 2,700 feet per second, general average speed for 140, 143 grain bullet. It's a little bit slow. It'll certainly do the job, but it's a light bullet. Well, the 270 Winchester shoots 130 and 140 grain bullets, so it's right in the wheelhouse for deer cartridge. Um, most of our other popular deer rounds are shooting somewhere between a 100 grain bullet to 150 grain bullet. You step up into the 30s and you might be pushing a 165. A few guys will go to 180s, but that's generally all the recoil a deer hunter wants to take. Well, what happens when you try an elk hunt? Well, a young friend of mine just a couple of weeks ago went elk hunting with his 6.5 Creedmoor, shot a nice 6x6 bull, one shot, 460 yards. That's further than I've ever shot an elk. But the point was his 140 or 143 grain, yeah, I think it was, it was a horn and a bull that I remember him telling me that, so it must have been that 143. He took that elk with one shot. 
Um, does that mean it's the ideal elk cartridge or moose cartridge or any other larger game animal? Definitely not, but it certainly can do the job and it is doing it. Now, if the Swedes have been shooting moose and caribou and bears and whatnot, wild boars included, with the 6.5 by 55 Swede all these years, it's pretty much proven itself because that thing goes about the same speed as the Creedmoor. Even though it has more powder space, it is not designed to take as much pressure. The standard pressure for this is 62,000 PSI. And if I'm not mistaken, this 6.5 by 55 is only 56,000. So there's some of the differences you get when you've got a bigger case that doesn't produce as much velocity as the shorter one. So you've got a pretty reasonable hunting cartridge here. I would say this is just about ideal for whitetail, mule deer, pronghorn, animals in that 100, to 250 pound range, shouldn't have any trouble with it. So uh, if you wanna use it as a hunting cartridge, go ahead, it's going to work just as well as the old Swede or the 260 or the 65284. And uh, figure around 2,700 feet per second with that 140 class bullet. But if you wanna to go to a lighter bullet, you can get a flatter trajectory and uh, carry plenty of energy at typical hunting distances by going to one of the lighter bullets. And as you can see with this big selection I've got here, you can go clear down to a 95 grain bullet, which is pretty good for lighter game environments or even just target practice at reasonable ranges to reduce the recoil. Then you can step up to 100 grain, 107, 120 are pretty popular. And the 129s and 130s, that probably falls right in wheelhouse for your average deer hunting bullet. And you know, shoot it a little bit flatter but with the 140s to 143s, what you're going to get that you don't get from those lighter bullets is wind resistance. And that's one of the reasons it became so popular for long range shooting. The one thing you cannot predict that bullet doing downrange is drifting in the wind. And at thousand yard targets, that wind can do a lot of crazy things between you and the target. So the value that's really appreciated by the target shooters is that long high BC bullets ability to resist that wind deflection. You'll sacrifice a little bit of velocity, you'll get a little bit more drop out of your bullet, but drop is constant. It's always the same at altitude. So if you know uh, what your drop is at uh, say a sea level versus 10,000 feet, you lock that in, you get those numbers in your head or put it on your scope, dial it up, that is going to be constant, but the wind comes and goes. So there's your value in those high BC bullets. Now, what about the 270? Why can't it compete? Well, maybe it can. <laughs> and that's why I think that article I wrote, that blog was so popular because there's a lot of fans of the 270 who are getting their toes stepped on by the 6.5 Trademoor. How does this old cartridge, this standard length action actually hold up? Well, you might be surprised. I have produced some trajectory charts and we're gonna look at those numbers. We're gonna compare recoil between these two and we're going to compare the wind deflection as well as the drop and the remaining energy downrange. Can the 6.5 Creedmoor really hold up to the old 270 Winchester? Stay tuned. <music>something else about the uh, configuration of this 6.5 Creedmoor case. The shoulder on it is 30 degrees. The 260 Remington has a 20 degree shoulder. This 6.5 by 55 has I think a 25 degree shoulder. What's the big deal with these shoulder slopes? Well, the, the sharper the shoulder, the more powder space you gain. So that's why the uh, Ackley improved cartridges were so popular. Those all have a 40 degree angle on it, so it's pretty flat, and that increases your powder capacity. But some complain that it interferes with chambering. You know, as you ramp up, you might get it hooked on there, slow down your chambering, or even get a little bit of a jam. I have never found that to be the case with even the 40 degree angles. But these days, it seems like all these new cartridges are pretty much standardizing with that 30 degree slope. So you've got that. You've got a pretty straight sidewall. If you compare it closely with this, you'll see that the old Swede has a little more slope to it. Now, the taper on a cartridge is just so that it can easily extract. 
And back in the days of early smokeless powder, they would sometimes get high pressures and the cases would stick to the sidewall. So they gave them a lot of slope. Modern cartridges are really getting away from that and going pretty darn straight. You'll also notice that the head size, the rim size, and the body size are identical. There are so many cartridges that have that 0.473 inch rim size and the body size at 0.470. The 30-06 family of cartridges, the 308 Winchester family of cartridges, it's just a whole lot of them out there and they all sprang from this and or the 757 Mauser. We'll have to do a little more historical research to figure out which one came first. But once they standardized that, all the other cartridge makers pretty much keyed off of it because rifles were built to fit that size, so a lot of different cartridges were built on that head size. And the uh, 6.5 Creedmoor is no exception. And here are the drop drift and energy ballistic numbers. 6.5 Creedmoor versus 270 Winchester. You can see the BC of the bullet, 143 grain BC 625, 2700 feet per second, pretty standard for the 6.5. 270 with 140 grain bullet, your BC is less quite a bit. 496 but you've got more velocity but that's the result less drop with that 270 at 300 yards at 500 yards heck all the way out to 900 yards it shoots flatter but the 65 creedmoor wins in the wind deflection category and that's the toughest thing now go to the 129 for a little more velocity and a flatter trajectory four inches of drop versus six inches and it matches up with a 150 grain bullet in the Winchester. We went 150 here to get our BC up, but then of course we lost some velocity. But those are the numbers, you can just study them, look through the whole thing and you'll begin to understand how all this stuff works. Really they're fairly closely matched, which adds legitimacy to anybody who says the 6.5 Creedmoor does compare with the 270 Winchester. And if you're at all concerned about recoil, well, let's look at this. 243 Winchester, pretty light kicking. Everybody knows that's a sweetheart to shoot. That gives you an idea of your energy recoil, foot pounds of energy, 10. The velocity at which it comes back to your shoulder, nine feet per second. Compare that with the 6.5 Creedmoor with a light bullet, with a heavier bullet, Winchester with a heavy bullet. Notice these two. Quite a bit more recoil from the 270. Not enough that I think bothers anybody, but some people are quite sensitive to recoil, so you might want to consider that. And then I threw a 3 out 6 in here with a 150 grain bullet because the military a long time ago determined that that was about what the average American soldier could shoot accurately all day in, in a fighting situation. Didn't beat him up too badly, so that's a good benchmark, 21.7 foot-pounds of energy. And then for the elk hunters, anybody who likes a heavier bullet, the 180 is going to ramp up the recoil. Anytime you get a heavier bullet and higher velocity, you get more recoil. Well, that's my comparison of the 6.5 Creedmoor and the 270 Winchester, and the great thing is... You get to decide what's going to work best for your brand of shooting and hunting. Now, I would heartily invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Give us your support. You can also find us on Patreon, a great little app that enables you to join the Ron Spomer Outdoors community and contribute more toward what we produce. We really appreciate all of our Patreon subscribers. And you can find us uh, at our YouTube right here but also ronspomeroutdoors.com website where we have lots of written material about this sort of stuff. And we're on Instagram at Ron Spomer Outdoors. We're on Facebook at Ron Spomer Outdoors. And now I'm doing podcasts in which I read some of the old magazine articles I started writing way back in 1976. And it's kind of fun to go back and uh, listen to those and, and see what has changed over the years because by golly, it really has not just rifles and cartridges, but scopes, optics, boots, just everything, even hunting techniques. So join us on the podcast. Uh, most of your podcatchers will have it, but you can go to ronspomeroutdoors.com and listen to them there as well. And, uh, that's about it for now. We're going to get back outside here. Covey is whining. She wants to go chase those pheasants. We've got a couple hours of daylight left. So we're going to get outside, enjoy some hunting and shooting of our own. Remember, hunt honest and shoot straight.